May we be given the faith to abandon our own ideas and take the Lord at his word, his confirmed word, whether we agree with it or not. Lord, your ways are not our ways, but you can enlighten us so our ways may be united without question to you. Amen. Well, my precious family, as in the last message, we started out for the hospital. I have to tell you, I have never seen the road so bad. Deep, slushy snow with steep drifts on the sides of the road, and the ruts were everywhere, so the truck was swerving back and forth as I tried to climb it. Very steep hill. Well, I made it up the hill, but lost a chain from spinning the rear wheels, and another one was loose, banging on the springs of the truck, so I stopped. It was a monumental job getting Ezekiel dressed into the car, getting packed, and we really couldn't believe the Lord wanted us to go to the hospital. It just didn't make sense. I know he can heal Ezekiel without a hospital getting involved. So I was mystified when Jesus began speaking to him all night yesterday about him going. And then in the morning, it was confirmed to me and through two other sources. Well, we were all getting the same readings, so we knew this was the Lord telling us to go to the hospital. Despite it not making any sense whatsoever, I packed and got him dressed, and we made it up the first incline and almost to the second when the chain broke and began hitting the springs on the truck. As I got out of the truck to look at the mess and the damage, Ezekiel began to seek the Lord about this trip to the hospital again. He had been incredulous as well that God would send us to a doctor. And within ten minutes he told me, Honey, this was an Abraham test. We don't have to go after all. The Lord just confirmed it. Oh, boy, I'm not proud of how I reacted. It took two hours to pack and get ready to leave, and I wanted to work on a message for you. So to say the least, I was frustrated. The truth is, that road was so bad, I don't think we could have made it out. Oh, my dear ones, pray for the man, David Romero, who has cold-heartedly cut off our access to the property. Pray for him. He's given everyone a key to the gates that they put up, but not one to us. He has no idea how we've suffered because of this. But if we pray for him, this suffering will turn into graces that will be good for his family's salvation. And at least we know that in suffering it's a good work and will someday bear sweet fruit. But in the meantime, we desperately need a bulldozer to maintain that road. We didn't need it when we had horses because the road wasn't getting chewed up by people coming in and out. We rode in on our horses and stayed here for a couple of weeks and then go shopping once every two weeks or deliver food to other people. So we didn't need a bulldozer then, but boy, we sure need something like that now. Well, I have to admit, I hated the idea of leaving the hermitage. I hated the idea of having to deal with doctors instead of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel's healing, but I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was telling us to go. When I sat at my altar, right after he confirmed to me that we needed to go to the hospital, he appeared visibly in the Spirit at my right and said, Do you trust me? I answered, Yes, Lord, I trust you. Then my mind did flip-flops again as I poured over all the reasons why we should not go to the doctor. (laughs) And he asked me again, still visible, Do you trust me? Yes, Lord, I trust you. (laughs) And then again my mind did its thing, and he said, very simply, Trust me. And I had such a peace, I could do nothing but get up and start packing. So here we are, all packed up, stuck in the snow with no chain on the left rear tire, and the right rear tire chain broken, No bungees on any of the chains. They'd been lost, I guess. And the Lord is telling us to back down this hill all the way to the hermitage. That in itself was an ordeal. Do you remember, dear ones, when Abraham was told by God to take his only son by Sarah, 
the son of his promise from God, and go to a mountain out in the wilderness and sacrifice him? Can you imagine what he felt as he traveled to Mount Moriah, which is where the Muslim mosque is in Jerusalem now, on the very site of the destroyed Jewish temple? But can you imagine what he was going through in his mind about killing his very own son, the one he waited a hundred years to have with Sarah? And his son was asking him, Father, I see the wood, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham replied in his supernatural faith, God will provide the sacrifice, my son. Wow. And I wanted to share something with you as an insight from a blog called Smoodox Blog, S-M-O-O-D-O-C-K, apostrophe S, blog. And this is what he had to say about this. I believe there is evidence in the wording of the text that God was indeed doing this thing as he endeavored to bring Abraham to the point of simply trusting him. Notice what the text says, and he said, Take now your son your only son Isaac, whom you love, and get you into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell you of. He continues to say, the wording here in Genesis 22.2 is similar to what we find in Genesis 12 when God called Abraham out of his own land. Notice that phrase, get you out of your country. Genesis 12.1 answers to the phrase, get you into the land, Genesis 22.2. And the same Hebrew word is used and means going, go. Also, the word for the land is the same in both verses. In Genesis 12, it is unto a land I will show you. In Genesis 22, it is into the land of Moriah. What is God doing, and what could Abraham be thinking at this point? In the first scripture, only Abraham is involved and is called upon to sacrifice his past. But in the second, Isaac is also involved, and Abraham is called to sacrifice his future. What a beautiful insight that is from this blog. He continues, in other words, he is called upon to trust God and only God to bring about what he had promised. Keep it in mind, guys, that the Lord promised me Ezekiel would be healed. The wording in both accounts implies that Abraham is forced to consider God's original promise with what Abraham is asking him to do in Genesis 22. Every hope Abraham had at this point was wrapped up in his son Isaac. Yet God, who made himself the surety of his own promises to Abraham in Genesis 15, was now asking Abraham to work against his own hopes. No matter what Abraham does at this point, this moment would show itself to be one of those defining moments that forms not only the thinking and identity of Abraham for the rest of his life, but also it would shape the thinking and identity of all those who would come after him, who would look to him as their father. Wow. And that's a smooth ox blog the context of the binding of Isaac. Okay, so in other words, Jesus promised me that Ezekiel would not die, and a prophet said he would be healed in the wilderness, which I assume is here, but may not be. And now the Lord is telling me to take him to the hospital? Who can understand the inscrutable ways of God? Maybe he wanted me to have scans to prove that Ezekiel's illness was real so that when he gets healed, there's solid proof. Maybe he wants to involve the medical cures as well as supernatural. Oh, I was so full of questions and reasoning. The bottom line was that I believed God was going to heal him, not man, and taking him to a hospital contradicted that in my own mind. But I knew that he told me to do it, and it was confirmed by others. So here we were. Jesus spoke to his heart while I was surveying the damage done to the truck, and he said, Go back to the hermitage. This was only a test of obedience, such as I gave Abraham. Wow, was I relieved? <laughs> yes, I was relieved, but also peeved, because I had packed for five days. 
holy books, medicine, vitamins, just an extra habit, but also for Ezekiel. And here he was telling me to go home and unpack. I was happy but frustrated. Couldn't I have had this day for prayer and a message and music instead? And what about what I put our brother and sister through helping us to get ready? Do you see, family? Do you see how unsuited I am for this job? Who am I to question God's motives? A speck of dust at best. Lord, I repent. I am so sorry for questioning your doings. Obviously, this was an important test. And perhaps there are those who need to hear this so they can understand these kinds of contradictions. In any case, Jesus, your ways are perfect, and I am very sorry for protesting. Please forgive me. Jesus replied, my very little one, you are a pill at times, but I forgive you. I love you so very deeply, even your rebellious questions cannot take that love from my heart. Do you not love your cats when they put up a fuss and demand their way? or they don't come when you call them. You love them all the same. Thank you for recognizing my prerogatives and your presumption. Dear heart dwellers, the longer you dwell in my heart, the more you will understand my ways, that they are not your ways. Much of this training which is taking place on this channel is to get you to recognize and accept this truth without protesting. I approve of those who have already grasped this concept and made it a permanent fixture in their thinking. It is very tedious to have to explain oneself when one's ways are always perfect. It is so much easier for me when you know this truth and correspond to it with your whole heart when things seem so contradictory to you. This kind of thinking comes with age and experience in living for me alone. This is also what you must teach others, because very often human logic gets in the way and completely snafus and changes the course of action and determines your course when I would have preferred to determine your course. Think for a moment, those of you who choose your own husband, what is the tragic outcome of that decision? without having consulted me, without having it confirmed from me. This is why I want you to be accustomed to accepting my known and confirmed will and acting on it without question. As you grow into leaders, you will more fully understand how painful it is to deal with little ones that always need a human explanation to suit their compulsion to know. I bless you now, my precious ones, precious heart dwellers. I love you deeply. I am with you always. I take you by the hand and guide you as you are willing to be led. And soon I will bring you home to me in heaven. And there you will receive a glorious crown for your faithfulness. But in the meantime... I am imparting the grace of freedom from human logic and understanding and total trust in my decisions in your lives.